Dr. Gira Sine is from Parkview. She's a family physician. Uh, she works off of Lima Road. She's been doing this for six years. And um, she was very instrumental in opening my eyes to how diet can impact our patients. Even myself, it's about three or four years ago, we were talking about diet. And so she really opened up my eyes to um, how impactful it can be. So extremely thankful for you coming in, putting this together. You as well, Dr. Lynch. So uh, Dr. Lynch is an orthopedic surgeon uh, with O&E, and he deals particularly with hips and knees and reconstructive surgery. Um, and we're extremely thankful to have you here as well. And uh, let's start the part. All right. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks for having us out, John. Um, I, I think it's just really nice that this, you know, we can shed light on this topic, and I'm excited to kind of be able to discuss, I guess, my uh, thoughts behind it and the implications it's had for me and my patients. So why, why are we talking a whole food plant-based diet? Well, I can really think, I put these pictures up because I can thank my wife uh, for leading me down this path. Um, I think it's kind of astonishing, but I went through medical school, and I'm sure Kristen can say the same thing, um, and didn't learn any of this. And to me, I think it's a shame that uh, with the amount of research that's been done and the implications it has on health that it's not taught more. So I, I think it's great that we're able to be here tonight and kind of just, uh, uh, you know, shed some light on the topic. And I, I thank my wife for introducing me to that. So, um, oh, can you go back a couple? Sorry. Um, so what got me interested um, is this is kind of start. So again, um, I, you know, uh, my, my, my wife brought up the point that you know, eating, um, eating animal meat and uh, things of the such can cause cancer and heart disease. And I laughed at that thought. Um, we kind of uncovered some of these documentaries and they were, they were mind blowing, to be honest. So Forks Over Knives talks about the implications of eating animal products and what it has on basically most comorbidities that we treat, including heart disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, you name it. Um, so, I, you know, that, that's a great, great watch that's available on Netflix. Cowspiracy talks about the implications of animal agriculture on our, um, you know, on our planet as a whole and, and the amount of green, greenhouse gas emissions that's given off by it is astonishing. So, again, that's a mind-blowing thing kind of to think from an environmental standpoint, the benefits of doing this. And then Game Changers kind of debunks the myth that you have to eat meat to be strong and be a good athlete because um, they, they kind of look at some elite performing athletes that, that do that on a plant-based diet. Um, I had one more. Do you, can you go back a couple again? I don't know. I, I had one on a couple books there. Maybe not. There it is. Um, so I obviously want to delve into this more. So these were some of the, the reads that I, I found really good. So again, when we're looking at our health and the implications, we need to look at true science. And there's a lot of misinformation out there on what a good diet is. But if you want to really look at it from a holistic standpoint, you need to look at you know, what studies have been done. So the China study is the most comprehensive nutritional study that's ever been performed. Um, they looked at the, uh, basically the disease rates in China compared to America, the implications of what they ate compared to what we eat, and um, then the in different interventions that took place in terms of reversing the diet. And so this is an astonishing read when you read the chapters on heart disease and cancer, um, diabetes, and and what's been uncovered. And I think if you're looking at anything from a good scientific standpoint, that's probably the best place to start. And then um, some of these other books were written by Dr. Michael Greger, who he spends his lifelong career as an in internal medicine, looking at the facts. And um, I think when, when he's uncovered the good science, he, he points to the implications of diet and what impact it has on disease. And, and more often than not, it shows that uh, avoiding animal-based products is good for you and, and eating plants is I'm sorry, and eating plants is, is, is even better. Um, and then finally, sorry, go back. I had these long slides in the wrong order. Um, one more time. So um, these were two guys that I thought, I mean, their stories are awesome. So I Can't Hurt Me is, is he's, uh, David Goggins is a Navy SEAL. That book has been one of the more popular books on Amazon for a long time. I mean, um, the guy's story is incredible. Uh, being plant-based is just one aspect of it, but, um, he actually then inspired the guy on the left, Rich Roll, whose podcast is really inspirational, to kind of go down the same route. So Rich Roll was a lawyer who was stressed. He was an alcoholic, obese male in his 30s. That can relate to a lot of Americans probably. And he was walking up his stairs one night and had a heart attack and realized he needed to change his life. So he became sober. He went plant-based. He started doing these ultra marathons. And he's the only guy to do uh, three iron length triathlons within seven days. 
and he did it on that diet. So again, it just, I think, debunks that, um, you, you know, you, you have to eat animal products to be strong. And these guys' stories were certainly inspirational and, and kind of motivating me to make that change. So um, that's kind of just a brief overview. I mean, hopefully, if nothing else, this can spur your, your, uh, your thought to, to being uh, open to the idea of being plant-based. Because for me, when I thought about it, when I learned all this stuff, I thought, you know, I want to, when I'm retired and I'm 70, I don't want to be worrying about heart disease or, or diabetes or getting cancer. And I want to kind of like be like enjoying my last years of life. And I, and I did it simply to stack the cards in the right favor. Uh, and when I have a lot of patients come to my clinic now, I mean, we're, we're facing obviously an obesity epidemic, a crisis. Uh, as we'll get into, obesity is one of the leading cause of arthritis, which I treat. I love treating arthritis, but uh, it's something that can be preventable. And, and it's getting to the point where patients aren't even safe to undergo surgery. Um, so I think there's a lot that we need to do as a society to guide misinformation that's out there that's truly causing harm on people. And I'm just very thankful that we have this forum to speak on this and that you guys are open to listening to it. So with that being said, we'll get onto the topic, which is joint pain as it relates to um, diet. So um, osteoarthritis is, so I'm kind of talking mainly about arthritis because that's kind of mainly what I treat in my clinic. And um, I broke this talk down into basically osteoarthritis and then rheumatoid arthritis. So osteoarthritis is mainly what we see. That's a lot of times what, you, um, you know, after we obviously do the knee replacement and you guys are taking care of them, um, that's what caused them to, to, to be there in the first place. So it's a little bit of a misnomer because it makes you, you know, arthritis uh, means inflammation of the joint, but more often than not, it's some sort of etiology that damages the cartilage. So when the cartilage is lost, there's nothing we can do to replace it. So a lot of times once they're in my clinic, it's at the point where uh, they either decide to live with it or we do joint replacement. But it's, you know, it's one of the leading causes of musculoskeletal disability in the world. Um, the rates of it are, are increasing uh, both across the world and especially across the U.S. with 85% uh, of men um, over the age of 75 have it, or 85% of population over 75 having it. And so it's thought to be um, a disease process that's initiated and perpetuated by mechanical stress. So more often than not, it's either, you know, ACL injury or uh, meniscectomy, you know, those sort of things that damage the intraarticular structures of the joint that over time lead to um, the cartilage being lost, or as we will touch on um, obesity and overloading a normal joint is the other more common reason that we, we tend to see it. Um, so as with any disease process, and I think the big theme when, theme when you get into nutrition is it that it's a disease process that has an important interplay between environmental factors and genes. So a lot of times people think like, oh, I have a disease because my family has it and it runs in our genes, but genes are something that can be turned on and turned off based off the environment we put in it. And in arthritis, a lot of times it's either the forces we put on the joint or uh, it can be the nutrition that we're giving our body that can allow us to heal, heal appropriately. So obviously our lifestyle and our life events um, have major implications on, on arthritis and whether or not we get it uh, and, and how we cope with it. Um, so, it, you know, as I touched on earlier, it's a lot of times associated with trauma. It can be associated with uh, congenital defects. A lot of, uh, you know, sometimes we'll treat patients that have Blount's disease or tibia vera where they're overloading the medial side of the joint. A lot of times that may be the first to go bad. Uh, and inflammatory arthritis, which is a kind of the second half of this talk we'll, we'll touch on. And then neuropathic joints. So patients with diabetes sometimes lose sensation to their joint. And so a lot of times they'll overload the joint because they don't have that protective sensation anymore. And that can lead to arthritis down the road as well. Um, so some risk factors are aging. So as we age, we, we naturally lose some, some muscle tone, some proprioception, and those are protective to our joints. Females as they age, the, the thought behind that being that uh, estrogen and progesterone are protective to the joint. So uh, losing those postmenopausal can uh, increase your risk of arthritis, trauma, and then obesity. Uh, but in all cases, it's a uh, result from excessive joint loading, uh, and, uh, which alters the joint biomechanics. So um, again, getting, uh, this is just, uh, I found interesting, basically, so if you technically meet the, um, the diagnosis of BMI over 30, which would classify as obese, then you have a 60% risk of developing arthritis in some way, shape, or form versus if we have normal weight, which is only 30%. So obesity does double the risk. Um, being obese doesn't necessarily mean that the progression is uh, uh, any faster, which I found interesting. So 
when they did a study comparing obese to non-obese arthritic patients, their rate of progression did not differ. But um, having cardiopulmonary and other, uh, other comorbid diagnosis does play a significant role in your risk of developing knee arthritis. Um, so this is kind of my future. Uh, my, my interest in orthopedics began because I tore my ACL in high school football. Um, and it kind of led me down this path, but I think it's all also leading me to a path of total knee replacement someday, probably. But um, basically, without, without the ACL there, the meniscus sees a little more stress, um, and that becomes the, the stabilizer to that anterior drawer, that posterior horn of the medial meniscus. So over time, that goes out, and then once that goes out, then your cartilage tends to go out with that. Um, so, you know, there's some thought that by re reconstructing the ACL, we may be preventing arthritis, but there's also some studies that show that's not the case. Uh, but, not, but nonetheless, uh, the meniscus obviously play, play an important role in protecting against arthritis. Back in the day, they used to, you know, when they had a meniscus tear, they'd open and take the whole thing out. And when those patients come back to clinic, like their joints are destroyed. I feel so bad for them. I'm like, oh man, like we shouldn't have done that back in the day. But, um, but that's something we still deal with today when we're, we're, we're still treating those patients. So from a cell biology standpoint, cartilage, cartilage is a really amazing tissue type. It's, so it's an avascular tissue. There, there's cells inside the cartilage that produce the cartilage. They break it down, they reform cartilage, but um, those cells are avascular in nature uh, because if there are any vessels there, the vessels wouldn't really stand the sheer stress of the joint. So, but when those cells die, um, they're gone for good. So it's kind of one tissue that, that you get one, one good cartilage in your life. And once that's gone, it's kind of gone for good, but it has the ability to, it does have the ability to heal to a certain degree, but in arthritis, there's a decoupling where there tends to be a greater breakdown than production. Um, and uh, as I've touched on earlier with general arthritis, it's not an inflammatory process, although there have been shown to be some inflammatory cytokines there. There hasn't actually been inflammatory cells involved in that. Um, and there's multiple genes that may play a role in arthritis, but again, those can be modified based off, based off our environmental factors we uh, put into it. So this doesn't project very well, but um, this is just kind of a look at what on the left, normal cartilage is this really nice structure throughout and our arthritis on the right, it begins with kind of fissuring up at the, at, up at the top. And then once it gets all the way down to what we call the tide mark or this uh, calcified cartilage, once it gets through there, that's when it's, it's gone for good. And they're uh, typically you're looking at joint replacement potentially. So just kind of like, this is kind of the world I live in. When I look at this x-ray, this is a great appearing hip x-ray. There's good joint space there. There's no bone spurs present. There's no uh, sclerosis underneath the, uh, uh, the cartilage itself. And then this is a patient that greatly benefited from a total hip. So as you can see, she had a complete loss of her, her cartilage, her uh, really no joint space that you can see. And, um, and those are patients that are super happy, but again, this may be something that we can potentially prevent if we, uh, if we uh, you know, take care of ourselves in, uh, in the way we can. So this is an example of a total knee again. On the right side, you can see that right knee is bone on bone on the medial side and, and uh, then the knee replacement on the right. So this is one study I found that just um, uh, kind of highlights the association between, in this case, meat consumption and the prevalence of arthritis. And it showed that even like, you know, even meat once a week was associated with a 1.2 or 1.3 increased risk as compared to, compared to not eating meat and about 1.4 increased risk if you ate it more than once a week. And I, I think this is probably just more pointing at the fact as diet as a whole and like, um, but, but, but again, the, the interplay between what we put in our body and, and uh, the diseases that, that we have is, uh, is, is pretty astonishing when you delve into it. And then this is Michael Greger's most recent book. I just put this on here because uh, it's a great book that kind of touches on more of the obesity epidemic that we're facing and uh, the good science behind it um, in order to, to prevent obesity, which I think is going to be our biggest preventative measure at, at uh, the the uh, epidemic of joint replacements that's coming through. Right now, uh, there's about um, um, uh, almost a million knee replacements a year in the country, and that's projected to be over 3 million in 10 years from now, which is pretty astonishing. Um, and I think at some point, you know, it's great we have forums like this because we got it kind of just like we're trying to flatten the curve on the epidemic. We got to flatten the curve on this, you know, the, the, everything we're seeing with the obesity epidemic as well. 
So um, the second half touched on, we're gonna to touch on rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so uh, again, this is kind of a different arthritic process. It's not so much the cartilage damage, but it's more inf inflammation of the joint. So rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic autoimmune disease uh, with a genetic predisposition. And it's the most common of the inflammatory arthropathies. And basically it, your body produces um, these antibodies that attack other antibodies that then deposit in your joint. And um, it starts as a response in the soft tissue around the joint. And then it eventually starts to wear away the cartilage and at last it, it starts to wear away the bone um, as it progresses. So basically, again, there's these self antigens that see your own antigens as foreign. And then these complexes deposit around your joint. Uh, begin the soft tissues, then go to the cartilage, and then finally start to wear, to eat away at the bone itself. So this is a, a patient of mine that had severe arthritis of her hips, and this is what can happen over time. You can get what's called protrusio, where the hips actually start going into the pelvis, um, and uh, um, they're they're kind of funner cases to do, a little more difficult. But she she got a total hip on one side, and we're getting ready to do her other side later on. Um, so the benefits of potentially eating a whole food plant-based diet in rheumatoid arthritis. So there's a lot of thoughts between obviously the antioxidants constituents, some, uh, uh, some of the probiotics in uh, the diet fiber, and then um, changes our microbiome as a whole. And that'd be a whole nother talk in and of itself, but the thought of the interplay between what we put in our gut and our microbiome and the implications of our health are, are big. Um, and then some studies showing, you know, obviously if you eat that diet, then the symptomatology of RA decreases uh, significantly. Um, so omega-3 fatty acids uh, and RA. So uh, this, some studies looked at long-term intake of omega-3s and uh, it's, it's been shown to be protect, protective against RA. Um, and, and obviously supplementing that has, has helped decrease the symptoms in, in women. Um, so basically what fatty, you know, omega-3 is, is so fatty acids on the right basically are, they have these covalent, these double bonds in the structure and fatty acids are important for our, cell, for our cells, for the cell membrane, uh, and also especially brain function. Um, and omega-3 is just that when the third one at the end has a, basically a bond there, not to get too much into the science, but they're, um, they're in all sorts of plant-based food. You know, you think of omega-3s being in fish, but the truth is that they're high in fish because fish eat a lot of seaweed and algae, and then it, it, it stores up in the fish. But obviously eating fish has the negative side effects of the chemicals and pollutants that they eat beside that. So um, all omega-3s kind of start in the plant-based world, and this is, there's abundant, uh, you know, uh, foods out there where you can supplement and get, and get, get your omega-3s from a plant source. So obviously probiotics are, uh, you know, big hot topic as well. Um, and there was a randomized study that showed that uh, some patients with RA treated with lactobacillus casei, which is actually in milk, um, over eight weeks, it tended to decrease their joint pain and CRP levels. Um, and then a meta-analysis showed that obviously the pro-inflammatory cytokines of probiotics also, um, in this case, didn't actually show a difference their disease score. So I think this kind of questions the importance of where you get probiotics. So, you know, probiotics are basically, they're pro because they're supposed to be thought to be good for life and then biotics because they're, they're basically a culture of bacteria. So um, our gut is covered with bacteria and it's, it, what we eat has an influence on what bacteria flourish and thrive. And we need those bacteria to produce certain hormones that are very helpful to our immune system, to our brain function. And um, my thought is, you know, if they're getting lactobacillus casei from milk, maybe that's not the best source of, of bacteria to, to line your gut. So obviously the source of probiotics, I think, is, is important. Um, iron supplementation. Um, so obviously uh, iron is very important for hemoglobin function. I thought, you know, a lot of thought is that you have to eat meat to get your iron source. But again, uh, meat is high in iron because uh, all that iron actually started out from a plant-based source. Um, and you know, those are kind of some, some plant-based stores where you can get your iron. So lentils, chickpeas, beans, cashews, uh, goes on and on. Um, so you're not going to have an iron deficient uh, diet by eating a plant-based diet. Uh, and then antioxidants. So, uh, fruits and I guess, this gets to the, I, I, I guess, importance of eating, trying to eat foods in their whole form, because when you either cook or process them, you, you lose a lot of that kind of, um, micro nutrient properties of the food. So your, your antioxidants and uh, phytochemicals that are in the food are, are present in their whole natural source. 
Um, and so there's a lot of antioxidants in, in any fruits or vegetables that you eat. And, and certain supplements like selenium, vitamin A, C, and E uh, are in all those, uh, all those uh, basically foods listed there. And so those can be helpful. Um, and then this is just an example of the, the vitamin, vitamin E and where you can find that in a whole food plant-based diet. And then finally, um, obesity as it relates to RA. Again, I think obesity is, nowadays we term it metabolic X syndrome. So, you know, if, if, you're, uh, if you have a diagnosis of obesity, hypertension, and diabetes uh, with hyperlipidemia, we term it metabolic X. But a lot of times those go together because I think there's an interplay with, again, our environment and diet and, uh, and uh, the clinical entities that we treat. And it's been shown that obesity and RA, uh, you know, has been to, shown to be detrimental at decreasing the symptomatology long term and remission. And um, and I, I, you know, I think that again, looking at it, we're we live in me, you know, in Western medicine, we live in kind of this reductionistic society where it's like you have a diagnosis, you have a treatment. You know, if you have hypertension, you take a pill. If you have diabetes, you get insulin. And that's how we practice preventative medicine. And I don't really think that that's good practice. I guess you know, I think you know, prevention is not having the disease come about to begin with. And um, so, the, you know, I really admire Dr. Gerhardstein because um, she's taken an approach where she's getting patients with disease, but she's trying to change the lifestyle rather than give medications. And there's patients that get off their meds. And there's been studies to show that diabetics for, who've been diabetics for years who do a whole food plant-based diet within two weeks can be off insulin, which I mean, that to me is amazing. So, um, I'm really happy that we have this opportunity to speak on this and I thank everyone here for kind of being open-minded to listen to it. And, uh, I'm, I'm happy to speak on it cause I learn more every time I'm have to give a talk on it, which is good. And, you know, it gives me more ammunition when people ask me where I get my protein from and stuff like that. So, um, um, certainly, uh, you know, uh, it's good to be, yeah, I've been back in town now for a year practicing joints. So I know I haven't got to meet everyone here, but for those of you who have, you know, see my patients taking care of them. I appreciate it and be happy to talk to anyone afterwards if you have any questions or happy to introduce myself. So thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. No problem. I'm Kristen Gerhard Stein. I'm a family doctor at Parkview and I've been practicing for six years. I first learned about lifestyle medicine and eating a plant-based diet in 2010. And that was when I was in medical school, but I did not learn it from medical school. I actually learned it from watching the Oprah show. And she had a guest on her show that talked about eating a vegan diet and I learned about it. And then in residency, I had a director who geared me toward the China study and uh, Dr. Greger's work and how it can impact our health. And so I was sold when I learned about that in residency. And subsequently there's something called the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which I'll be sitting for my boards uh, this November to be board certified in lifestyle medicine, which basically uses how we live our lives to prevent and reverse disease. So how we eat and exercise, manage stress, how we sleep and avoid risky substances to prevent and reverse disease. Um, so this is my family, my husband, Aaron, our two kiddos, Reagan and Evan, and they're part of my why, why I keep on this lifestyle um, so that we can stay healthy and enjoy uh, going to the lake on the weekends and traveling and, and uh, again, to prevent diseases down the road. I also was diagnosed with high cholesterol in college, and so it's helped to bring my cholesterol down about 100 points on this lifestyle, so it's been really impactful for me personally. Okay, so I, I'm going to touch base on which foods cause inflammation, which foods help us to fight inflammation, where does this inflammation come from, and then touch base a little bit about the rotator cuff, the Achilles tendon, and if we have time, we'll watch a little video at the end. So um, we'll start by diving in with uh, which foods can inflame us. And so basically it's harmful fats, processed meat and red meat, and then processed carbohydrates. And so the harmful fats are going to be your trans fats and solid fats. And when you think about solid fat, it's like if you look at a piece of steak, you can see the white gristling through it. That's solid fat, and that can be harmful to increase our inflammation. Um, the solid fats also in butter and full-fat dairy products. Um, processed meats would be your bacon, salami, lunch meats, hot dogs, pepperonis, um, and red meat. And then the processed grain flour, so white flours and white sugar, so the cookies on there. 
Um, so which foods are anti-inflammatory? So some of the most anti-inflammatory foods are going to be your cruciferous vegetables. So kale and broccoli and cabbage, um, the dark, brightly colored berries, your brightly colored fruits and vegetables. So the orange, yellow, and dark green fruits and veggies. Uh, ground flaxseed is also a great source. Um, it can help to reduce joint pain. And then turmeric. So the curcumin found in turmeric spice is very anti-inflammatory. Um, so where does this inflammation come from? And I wanted to just introduce this topic to you. It's something I've learned about since graduating from medical school, and I didn't really know about it in medical school, but it's this thing called an AGE, and it's advanced glycation end product. And so it's basically just a compound that forms um, from a chemical reaction between a protein and a sugar. Um, our bodies can make some of this inside of us, but we also get it from what we eat. Um, and these AGEs are associated with oxidative stress and inflammation. And they're linked to causing a variety of different uh, chronic diseases like obesity, insulin problems, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, um, kidney problems, heart disease, osteoporosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, cognitive impairments. I've even seen dementia listed in cancer. So a lot of different diseases are implicated by these AGEs. Um, and they're naturally occurring in raw animal foods. Um, you see low values of AGEs in carbohydrate-rich foods like fruits, vegetables, milk, and whole grains. Um, but then the highest amount of AGEs are found in beef, and then second cheeses, then poultry, pork, fish, and eggs. Um, so interestingly, it depends on how we cook the food too. So if heat is applied and at higher and higher temperatures, the AG level, AGE level will increase. And so ways to cook your food such as grilling and broiling, roasting and frying significantly increase the AGE level and can cause more damage. And then these AGEs build up when there's just too many present. Um, and they can lead to damage for especially cells that have like a, a long life. So nerve and brain cells, et cetera. Um, and why we're here talking about mobility and arthritis. Um, so there's increasing evidence that poor mobility outcomes are linked to higher AGE levels. Um, so I found some of the same research as you did in your journey doing this talk. So the same article um, from the Nutrition of Health and Aging that eating meat even less than once a week can increase the risk of developing degenerative arthritis and soft tissue disorders. Um, so we were talking about articular cartilage. And so this links in, you know, the cartilage gets destroyed with arthritis. And there's studies showing that increased AGE levels can negatively modify the articular cartilage. It increases its stiffness and induces degradation of the extracellular matrix of the cart cartilage. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this one was interesting. It looked at high-level male athletes and their Achilles tendon. And it tried to find a non-invasive way to measure the AGE damage to the tissue. And they use this process called SAF, skin autofluorescence. It's just a non-invasive way to measure the AGE damage. And overall, the study found that a more Western type diet, which is high in processed foods and the white flours, white sugars, meats and dairy, um, in these youth, it was associated with increased glycation or damage to the Achilles tendon. Um, it also interestingly showed that long-term exercise can lead to a modest reduction in that glycation or damage, and it can increase the Achilles tendon size, which may protect against it getting injured. So in summary, uh, studies are showing now that AGEs do accumulate in the bones, the joints, and skeletal muscle, and they may play an important role in development of osteoporosis, arthritis, and sarcopenia, which is just that loss of muscle mass with aging. So overall, so kind of take homes for how do you lessen the amount of AGEs that we're eating? Um, and it's by increasing the amount of unprocessed whole foods uh, like vegetables and fruits in your diet, legumes, which is the family of beans and lentils and split peas, um, and then all whole grains, and then to try to decrease consumption of fatty meats, solid fat, full fat dairy products. Try to prepare foods less often with that really intense heat cooking, so the grilling and frying and broiling but instead to cook them with um, moist heat. So boiling, stewing, steaming, and poaching are preferred ways to cook. Um, so this is a great book as well. It's called The Blue Zones. It's by Dan Buettner. Um, he's a National Geographic journalist that 
traveled the world with a bunch of researchers to find the zones across the world where people live the longest into their 90s and 100s. And they found five pockets across the world where they have really high levels of 90 and 100 year old people. And they studied, well, what do they do to achieve that longevity and live independently? And two of the five pockets of these older uh, populations were um, in the Mediterranean and in Asian cuisine. So Okinawa, Japan was one, and then um, Italy and Greece were two others. And so by eating this way, either a Mediterranean style cuisine or Asian cuisine, that's another way to help reduce your AGE consumption. And so Mediterranean diet is very similar to a whole food plant-based diet. So I'll talk to my patients about that a lot where the Mediterranean diet is 90% plant-based. And so the Blue Zone shares that these populations that live the longest, um, about 90% of their diet is plant-based. And they do have some meat and dairy. They have it may meet maybe five times a month on average. And so they do have meat, but it is limited, much limited compared to our standard American diet. Um, but yet we see really great outcomes with these populations. And so I'll try to encourage my patients to, you know, cut back. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing approach where we know that a predominantly plant-based diet can be significantly helpful for kind of preventing those diseases we see in America. Um, so touch base a little bit on rotator cuff as well. So this picture here is Dr. Jimmy Conway, and he's an orthopedic surgeon from Oklahoma. I had the chance to listen to him speak at a conference in California last year. It's called the Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference. It's fantastic. There's all different kinds of healthcare providers there from life coaches to physical therapists to dietitians to pharmacists to nurses, nurse practitioners, doctors, um, all host, you know, a whole host of people that come to this conference, but there's over a thousand people that come each year. It's a fantastic conference. He talked on the, or talked about the rotator cuff and said that a rotator cuff tear is like a heart attack of the shoulder, which I found really interesting and had never thought of it in that fashion. Um, and he shares a little bit why in the next couple of slides, but he himself was a college football athlete and had 11 knee surgeries and one spine surgery and had been living with pain for a long time and shared that, you know, he was in having pain for, you know, day to day and living in his 40s. But when he switched to a whole food plant based diet, he's living relatively pain free, despite likely already developing arthritis, like it maybe didn't get rid of the arthritis, but it's helping his, his pain and his function. Um, so he shared that there really is a link between having these cardiac risk factors and a rotator cuff tendinopathy. And what that means is, you know, our high blood pressure, high cholesterol um, can really affect the tendon function. Um, and there was a study last fall published on the effect of these AGEs on rotator cuff cells as well. Uh, and he shared that a normal rotator cuff should not tear because it's two times stronger than the muscle. Um, so we're supposed to injure the muscle before the cuff will tear. So it's really a blood flow issue that can lead to the rotator cuff tearing. And so if we think about high cholesterol, how it can impact our arterial health, um, that same process can affect the tendon health. And he kind of gave some rule of thumb. So if you're seeing a patient who's 50 years or older and they're coming in with shoulder pain, you think a rotator cuff injury, but if they're under 50, you typically would think instability. However, because of the cardiac risk factors going up over time and more and more people being diagnosed with obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol at a younger and younger age, he is seeing younger and younger patients that are coming in with rotator cuff tears that he's having to repair in their 40s um, because of having these cardiac risk factors. So he will give some information to his patients on how to recover from a rotator cuff tear and after the surgery um, and increasing the dark leafy green vegetables. So angiogenesis, that's the term, it just means the formation of new blood vessels. And it's the mechanism where our tendons will heal. And so he wants his patients to eat, you know, these kale and arugula and spinach and broccoli and Swiss chard and other green leafies to improve um, blood flow to the tendon um, after the time of surgery. And he'll give out a list of these top 10 nitrate rich foods. And nitrate is a substance that's found in vegetables that can help improve and open up our arteries. It's considered a natural artery dilator. Um, and eight of the top 10 nitrate rich foods are dark leafy green veggies. And I listed them all here. So the two that are in red, the beets and the rhubarb are not dark leafies, but Swiss chard, oak leaf lettuce, the beet greens, spring greens, basil, 
Um, butterleaf lettuce, cilantro, and arugula are all super rich in this nitrate substance that can dilate their arteries and improve tendon healing. So I wanted to share one of my own patients that has seen me for probably about five years now. Um, he's actually a very fit male, BMI 24. He works out every day, cardio, weightlifting, um, super healthy, 67-year-old guy. But he reported to me that he was having knee pain every day, going up and down the stairs, just day, to, day in, day out. Um, and he and his wife switched to a predominantly whole food plant-based diet back in 2015. And he noticed in his own life that um, his daily knee pain with stairs, it just went away after he cut out meat. So it, again, it probably didn't get rid of the arthritis, but it, it really helped his pain and his function. Okay, so this is a video we're going to watch about Mike Rashid, who's a power bodybuilder. Um, watch just the first five minutes of it, and then we can open it up for Q&A at the end. I apologize, there is one curse word, so if it gets in here, I'll bleep it. Um, he's a very passionate man, so we'll listen to him here. We'll try to avoid the curse word, though. At after five minute mark. This is just the ad. There you go. Okay. So Mike was a former boxer and now still a power bodybuilder. So he gets the question a lot too, where do you get your protein from? And he's very strong and has maintained his strength, but he kind of talks about his experience with um, his diet change and how it helped with his joint pain. Um, but he still has been able to maintain his strength. So that was Mike Rashid and his experience with transitioning to uh, cutting out meat from his diet and kind of how he did that. And some people, they like to cut out meat gradually like he described every other day. Um, and then in others, it's like cold turkey, you just want to do from their normal standard diet to completely meat free. Um, so it's different for each person and I try to meet people where they're at in regards to making those changes. Um, but we are finished with our talk, and I just want to thank everybody for coming, and I'd like to open it up for any questions that you have or comments or suggestions. Um, we'll open it up here. Yeah. How do you guys, I mean, just thinking, like, uh, from a personal standpoint, like, how do you make this type of diet work with, with children, like, in families with children? Yeah. Do you need me to? I, I have a one year old, so let's have you take this. Do you want me to repeat the question? I'm trying to figure that out myself. Yeah. So the question was how do we incorporate this for families that have children? And my kids are seven and five. And so we've done this uh, really since they were really little. And so it's been, we've been able to incorporate it since they were little. Um, there are statements that you can raise children after they're weaned from the breast milk, even on a whole food plant based diet, and they get all the nutrients that they need. So they are not missing out by not having cow's milk. You can do soy milk, which has protein and calcium in it. Um, so in regards to nutritional deficiencies, there's really no need to drink milk. I, I know it's like controversial to say in the United States, but really studies show kids don't need cow's milk after they're, they're weaned from their mom's breast. And adults simply don't need cow's milk either. Mil you know, milk is meant for a baby calf. It's not meant for adults. And so we really don't need it. There's no nutritional reason to have cow's milk. Um, we get our protein, our fat, our calcium, vitamin D through other sources. We don't need the, the milk. So I know that's like kind of mind blowing for a lot of people to hear. And I was, I was flabbergasted when I first learned of that, when I was learning about milk and I thought there's no way I've drank milk two or three times a day since I was a kid. And I was in my mid twenties when I first gave it up and I'm like, drink water for dinner. Like it was just yeah. Mind blowing, but you don't you don't need milk. Um, but for babies from 12 months to 24 months, I usually say soy milk in the office, like a full fat soy milk. Um, but in terms of just incorporating 
you know, fresh fruit and vegetable, a whole grain and a bean, giving them a smaller portion than what you would for an adult. Um, we have tried a bunch of different uh, recipes in my family and some kids, you know, some of my kids hate and some they love. And so we've kind of gotten our routine of ones that they really will enjoy. And so I'll prepare plant-based meals for them at home throughout the week. But then if they're with grandma and grandpa or a friend or a baby, you know, babysitter or party, we don't enforce you know, 100% plant-based with them when they're away, but we cook that way at home um, and just encourage them to try a bite. And then if they don't like it, they get unlimited fruits and vegetables for the rest of the meal and um, and kind of take it that way. So I'll just touch on the milk too, because I found that interesting because um, my wife was kind of looking into that a little bit. And um, I guess, so breast milk has a higher concentration, of both omega-3 and uh, healthy fats compared to uh, cow's milk. Um, so that was kind of something we found interesting, which is really important for brain development. Um, so I think that's one reason a lot of pediatricians push, you know, breastfeeding as long as you can. Um, there's been some studies show that type 2 diabetes, I'm sorry, type 1 diabetes may be related to dairy intake. So maybe our bodies, again, seeing a foreign response in the milk and then attacking our, our own uh, pancreatic cells. And there's been some research looking at that maybe a, a cause of type 1 diabetes. Uh, and then our guts have an enzyme called lactase, which breaks down, you know, lactose, obviously. And uh, lactose only comes from either breast milk or some other, other dairy source. And lactase, after about age 10, our gut stops making it, which is why most people are naturally lactose intolerant. So I think it's just, again, our, our body's kind of natural way of saying maybe dairy's not meant to be something, but I found that kind of interesting, too. So. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? You want to start, John, or did you? Um, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so turmeric is known as one of the most anti-inflammatory spices. Um, in regards to dosing, I'd have to review kind of how many milligrams and such. Um, there are certain brands over the counter that have different things added to the turmeric. So if I'm recommending, I say just get the straight up curcumin or turmeric. And um, you can even add it to your food though too. It doesn't have to be in a capsule form. You can add turmeric to soups and stews. It makes things brightly orange colored, but it doesn't have much flavor. And so you can add it to a lot of different foods to increase the anti-inflammatory nature of your cooking. Um, I've had some patients that have tried it and found benefit from it and some that really haven't, but then part of me wonders, well, what other things are they eating that's inflaming them that maybe they're not seeing the effect of the turmeric? So if they're still eating white flour and white sugar and cheese and the processed meats, then they maybe they won't see the full effect of the turmeric. So, um, so that's interesting to think about. But yeah, I usually would say add it to the food with the whole spice itself. Or and Dr. Gregor, uh, interestingly, he has a free app called the Daily Dozen, and he he incorporates turmeric into your check boxes to try to get every single day. And so for each individual, it's either a quarter or a half teaspoon per day for each individual. He recommends just eating the spice itself and adding it in in creative ways. So you can even add it into a smoothie in the morning, like a fruit and vegetable smoothie. Um, but that's one that he really encourages eating every single day on the Daily Dozen app. But if you do buy it in a capsule form, just try to get straight up curcumin or turmeric and not anything else added to it. Yes, that's a great question. And I, I have like a growing list of patients that I have been able to help make these lifestyle changes. And I'll be honest, it's not everybody. Not everybody's ready to make that change. And uh, it's really exciting to see those that do make the change and come back and see the effects that they've had. Uh, however, one thing that I've been learning about just behavioral science is encouraging your patients to think about their why and what is their why because if they don't know their why, they're not going to stay motivated to make that change and keep with that change. And interestingly, um, learning too about how success is not a motivator, nor is fear. So the fear of getting cancer or the fear of getting diabetes or the fear of getting arthritis is only a temporary motivator where they might be able to make that change and stick with it for a week or two, and then they kind of fall off the wagon. 
because it's not enough to keep them motivated. And then similarly, success is not a long-term motivator. So the person who signs up for the 5K or the 10K or the marathon or half marathon, they have that goal in mind. And once they reach that goal of that success of finishing the race, then they're done. And then their motivation to keep with those lifestyle changes may kind of fall by the wayside again, unless they sign up for another race. Um, but other good, you know, reasons why would be family or travel or, you know, avoiding, um, um, being in a nursing home, you know, like keeping your independence and things like that. A lot of people, it's their family and travel and, um, just av avoiding the necessity to live, uh, dependent on someone in the, in the nursing home later in life. So making them think about their why, um, and write it on an index card, put it on the refrigerator and like have them see that visually so that they know why they're making the change. That's like the, the mainstay for first steps. Uh, and then I have a bunch of resources that I can give them, but you know, thinking about um, some of us will know that information, but then how to translate that into change is harder. So I think the first step though is finding your why before you even decide to make a change. Yeah, I think um, I think it's those are all great points. I think in, in my uh, my clinic it can be tough because we see a lot of patients in a short period of time, and most more often than not, for me, it's the patients that um, really have really bad arthritis, but they're not healthy enough to get a joint replacement because you're really high risk for infection or wound healing complications. So. Um, you know, we have, I have a very good heart to heart and I say, you know, I have to say like, I, I can understand it'd be very painful in this to be in your position, but uh, I'm going to have to ask for some work on you on the front end to help optimize your outcome in the long term. And right now I don't feel it's safe to do surgery. And most people are very understanding of that, I think. And most people want to get better, you know, like, the, you know, they didn't choose to, to go down this path. It's, I think we're victims of the society and kind of what we have around us. And so uh, for a lot of people, it's groundbreaking to hear someone say what I say. And I say, you're probably not going to believe me when I say this, but I recommend you eat a whole food plant-based diet and this may help. And a lot of them are very open to it. And um, so far I've seen some success and because people want to get, get rid of their hip and knee pains. So this is a motivating factor for them to, to try and get optimized for surgery and become healthy. And um, it's kind of like smoking cessation. Like a lot of times we require them to stop smoking for two weeks before and two weeks after surgery. Sometimes those are the happiest patients because they quit smoking for good. So um, I think a lot of times in my eyes, it's, you know, to get a joint replacement, but uh, for the patients who do make the change there, they wind up not only having a better outcome, but then they have a better lifestyle down the road. And then we, you know, again, it's tough in the short interval of my clinic. So a lot of times I'm really happy to see that uh, Dr. Gerhard Steen has already started a, a forum in the community where we meet once a month and she gives talks. I'm trying to get involved with that because that just becomes kind of a more of a communal basis for patients to get together and work together towards, towards improving lifestyle. Yeah, plug for Powered by Plants. We yeah. have a Powered by Plants meetup that's a once a month uh, free support group that we started two and a half years ago now at Parkview. And it's led by myself and Kathy Worley, who's a dietitian at Parkview. And so that's another way that you can direct your patients to the Parkview Center for Healthy Living. And it's a free support group. They just call the Center for Healthy Living and can get the monthly e-newsletter. And that will direct them to the, like the time and um Day, you know, day of the week where we have that. It's been on Zoom since COVID until the Center for Healthy Living opens back up. Um, but typically we have it at Center for Healthy Living, which is on DuPont Road um, near the Pine Valley Plaza. And it's like a one hour meetup where we'll, we'll give like a 20 or 30 minute talk initially, and then we open it up for Q&A and support. And it's a way to motivate patients to make those change and stick with them. Yeah. Tell me about my diet. Okay, so it's been really a 10 year journey for me in regards to making change and sticking with it. And so that's why I don't expect my patients to make the change overnight. Where in 2010, when I first started, um, it's from watching the Oprah show, and I'm like, okay, I'll give it a try for a month. And then in my pregnancies, uh, 2012 and 2015, I did eat some chicken and fish and Arby's and pizza. Um, so I'm definitely not perfect, but then really 2017, um, is when I went to a conference out in California and listened to some of the greatest researchers in this field, Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Campbell, who wrote the China study and Dr. Greger and all these amazing people in the lifestyle medicine field. And I'm like, I have to do this. And so really from 2017 onward, I've, my husband and I both have really been sticking with it, um, uh, much more closely. So I, uh, 
don't eat any meat at all, no fish. Um, I'm dairy free as well. The weakness I still have is sweets. And so I try not to have them in the house. Um, if we're at parties, I'll probably have a cookie or a brownie or something like that. That's my one weakness. When you think about being like predominantly plant-based, I'm, I want to say probably 95% plant-based because that wiggle room with the sweets, I'm still working on it. Um, trying to have fruit instead of, uh, sugary sweets, but that's my one weakness still. Um, but that's kind of been my journey. It's been a 10 year thing of trying to find ways that I can stick with it. So keep working at it and encourage your patients to keep working at it. Cause it takes time to make those changes that you can stick with. Yeah. And I would, I would echo a lot of that. I mean, um, so I, was, I've only been doing it for about four years. Um, it was about probably five years ago or six years ago, I guess when I saw cowspiracy and that was the one on the environmental facts of animal agriculture. And I was like, oh, I want to like leave a good footprint for earth. And so I tried to go vegan cold turkey and it did not go well. And so I kind of became pescatarian. I gave up meat and I was like, oh, I'm doing something good. I'm give up meat. So I did that for about a year. And then I watched the forks over knives and kind of started learning about the health benefits of it. And then I slowly got off fish for about six month period and then eventually gave up the dairy. So it was really about a two year transition for me. And I agree hundred percent with you know, the video we said, I think it's hard to do it overnight because you do have a microbiome, your, your bacteria used to seeing certain foods. And if you take it all away at once, I think you're going to disrupt your, you know, kind of inner homeostasis. So I think you got to do it, you know, transition. I too am probably about 95%. You know, if I am at a party or if someone brings in a baked good or a donut, you know, every once in a while, like, you know, I'll maybe eat that, but I, I, do, I don't eat like cheese or, or meat or fish. Um, it's not about being perfect. It's about, you know, trying to be the best you can. I still try to strive every day to eat a little better because um, just being plant-based in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean you could still be an unhealthy, unhealthy vegan and eat fried foods or high fat plant-based foods. So uh, I'm still striving to, you know, try and better my diet every day, but it's easy once you get into it. I think it's hard making the transition and it's hardest in the environment where you're at a restaurant that maybe not doesn't cater to it, but I think over time, things are becoming more vegan friendly and uh, it's becoming easier, but it's tough when you're at like a meeting and they take you to a steakhouse and you're like, oh, geez. Uh, and then I break to the rep. I'm like, I'm vegan. They're like, oh, sorry. So, <laughs> but uh, oh, the four veggie side. Yeah, 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 exactly. Four sides of veggies. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there's, uh, there's, I don't know the numbers, but, uh, like beans, super high in protein, obviously peanut butter, super high in protein, lentils, chickpeas, split peas. So the, um, the number, like the high protein consumption kind of became, I think a little bit mythical because back in the day, there were some studies showing that if you eat like a high amount of protein, it builds muscle mass. And so that number 120 grams a day kind of became an arbitrary number. There's been some studies in the 1970s showing that 30 to 40 grams a day is sufficient because our body actually synthesizes protein. So as long as you get the essential amino acids, all of which come from plants, you have the building blocks to make the protein you need. So we only need about 30 to 40 grams a day. The average vegetarian gets about um, 60 to 70. And then most the standard American diet gets about 120. Most of that, which is tied to saturated in uh, you know, or high saturated in animal based protein, which can have detrimental effects. So um, the thing that's not talked about is fiber. So I think fiber is a very important substance that's in plants and it's an umbrella term for carbohydrates that our body can't break down. And those, the fiber holds water, it holds toxins, it helps eliminate waste and, um, and also uh, helps healthy bacteria flourish that produce hormones that help our body. So uh, by eating processed or animal based foods, a lot of times not only we're getting bad protein, but we're also not getting the amount of fiber that we need to. So I think there's an important interplay that sometimes isn't discussed, I guess. Yeah, that's good. A lot for calcium, uh, I usually recommend uh, like sesame seeds, beans, uh, nuts, soy milk, um, dark leafy green vegetables are rich in calcium. Uh, spinach is a dark leafy green, but it has oxalates. So I still eat spinach. But it's not a reliable source of calcium because the oxalates and spinach can bind up the calcium. Not that it's harmful. It's just not uh, one of the sources of plants that you would rely on for your calcium. Um, interestingly, too, there's some studies showing that those who eat a predominantly plant-based diet may not require as much calcium in their diet as a plant 
or sorry, as a meat eating kind of diet. Um, and the idea is that those who eat a standard American diet might pee off more calcium, and so they might need to eat more calcium. And so those on a plant-based diet actually may need to consume less calcium compared to someone on a meat eating diet. And so, um, but typically if you're getting this variety of fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains and legumes, so beans and lentils, nuts and seeds, you're gonna get adequate amounts of calcium and protein in your diet. Um, in terms of protein powder, there are vegan protein powders. Um, they are processed, so, and I don't really like them. I don't like whey-based either. I think they're kind of chalky. I just don't eat protein powder. My husband does, he eats a vegan protein powder. He weight lifts, um, he does it probably once a day. Uh, but you can find like pea proteins um, and soy proteins for vanilla and chocolate flavor to do your, uh, like a protein shake if you wanted to do that. Another way to add protein into your seeds in the morning is to get silk and tofu. That's a soybean based protein. Um, and it can add a lot of protein to your smoothie, which makes it just creamier and it's not as chalky as adding a protein to your smoothie, protein powder to your smoothie. Um, so that's one way I would sometimes add more protein is a silken tofu and silken just means soft. So there's soft tofu, firm and extra firm tofu and the silken is super soft. And on the picture, you can find it at Kroger. It's got a picture of a smoothie on the front. It's meant to be made into sauces and creamy sauces and smoothies. So we are over our time. So I don't know if there's any last questions, but thank you so much everybody for attending and uh, we're glad to Maybe take questions off to the side if there's more, but we'll be sensitive to your meeting you've got here coming up. So thank Thanks, you so Sarah. much.